Uh, we'll have a panel debate in a short moment. My name is Bjarke Moller. I'm a director of a think tank called Europa in Copenhagen, independent think tank. And I'm very pleased to be here uh, for this debate about Europe's uh, growth challenge. It's uh, indeed a huge question. Um, sometimes you, you think about growth, uh, you think about we actually are living in a, a time of very uh, prosperous times and uh, we actually are very comfortable with our lives, but uh, growth is really indeed a, a huge challenge for Europe. And um, there is a big price coming up for McKinsey. Uh, how to solve that? Uh, you can participate in that. We just uh, announced uh, formally. But uh, maybe we'll have some economists helping us out. Uh, and I think that's, I would like to present the panel now. Simeon, will you please be here once more? And then I'll have uh, Philip Schroeder, professor of um, the um, business school, just up here. And we'll have Bo Sandeman Rasmussen, professor as well at the business school. And we'll have Clemens Yata, and uh, director at McKinsey and partner at McKinsey & Company. While we're having the debates, um, we'll have uh, some prizes there, and you can engage. You'll have the possibility on Slido to, to forward your questions. Um, and uh, there are two books online, two books by Simeon Jankov. I think they are very uh, interesting, and at least the, the great rebirth, it could be very interesting for you now. Uh, and inside the Euro crisis. Um, I think it's a, a good opportunity to, to have this conversation. Uh, and I'll start out with the first one is that, uh, according to all the indicators, Denmark is really performing very well. Why do we have a growth crisis in Denmark? Bo Sanderman, you are, as a former member of the Tax Commission, you've been very engaged in the macroeconomic debates uh, in Denmark. Could you please help us out here? I guess there's a kind of short-term growth problem and a longer-term growth problem. And the short-term growth problem, uh, I think, is coming out of the, of the financial crisis, hit very hard uh, on Denmark, and uh, really has led both to kind of consumers and, 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 and firms being very reluctant to, to spend any money. Uh, if you compare kind of the resources they have, they could uh, increase private consumption and investment uh, easily, but for some reason they, they don't want to. And that certainly has been, been leading to low growth for the past six, seven years now. Mm. And then there's a, the longer term issue, which is, I guess is even more important. Uh, how will growth in the next 10, 20, 30 years um, evolve in Denmark? And, and there, of course, we can start looking at the numbers. What are the, kind of the growth potential in, in Denmark? And uh, certainly we have only met, uh, made some reforms, but if we have want to have growth at at least, let's say, 2% a year, uh, we probably need to have more reforms that can either uh, increase uh, the labor force or can make for, for people more productive so that the, the capacity for growth uh, will increase. And going to the productivity is really one of the, 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 the core questions for Europe as well, because we have a stagnation of productivity in Europe, uh, and it's quietly, quite deeply interlinked with the, the economic growth crisis. You were on the, 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 the Productivity Commission, Philip Schroeder, uh, looking uh, outside of the borders of Denmark. What is really the core of the productivity problem for Europe? I think what, what is uh, at the core, and it's very much echoed in, in the debate we actually had today and yesterday in, in Denmark, since we have the, the government top meeting in Marienborg where we discuss this, and actually tackling that, that growth issue that Bo just explained, is that productivity is at the, at, at the core. And if you think about what is going wrong, and I think I, you, you sense it already in the talk we just had, is that uh, we haven't harvested all the potential for uh, full uh, competition within Europe. Not all our markets are as liberalized as, as we tend to believe. And uh, so competition, increased liberalization, increased internationalization turn out to be key in triggering uh, future productivity. And only by opening up and by, by allowing that productivity boost to ignite industry dynamics in Europe, will you actually see then future growth in Europe? We have actually an interesting question coming up here. How will Europe try to improve the technological innovation? Um, and I can't see it here now on my screen, but anyway, <laughs> Clemens uh, Yatha, you're also into digital technologies, and I think really that is one of the, the issues also raised in, in the presentation by uh, Simeon. Um, and there's a very a big disparity in, in performance in inside, European, inside the European Union. But compared to the United States, we're really laggards, uh, aren't we? Well, we, we are we're laggards in building 
technology companies, that's for sure. Um, in, in many sectors, you're actually at par or even better at, at using technology in, in making business. And, uh, and I think kind of that is one of the key opportunities also that we have uh, going forward. We have already, we, we can't see it because we're in the middle, end, middle of it, but we have actually already been through a significant transformation. Right? I mean, we have a telco in Denmark that used to have 25,000 employees. They now have 7,000 or 8,000. Mm -hmm. We have banks that had thousands of branches. They have now hundreds or even, even less. Uh, so, so we are using technology in some sectors very effectively. And when I saw the charts on, on online banking, and I, I saw some of our, our Scandinavian peers in the very top, it is not just around using online banking. It is also then transforming the sector that's behind. And then you get the productivity benefit that we are looking for. And it's actually going across all kind of sectors. Also the public sector is also be becoming digitalized. So Simeon, have you been studying the issue of the need for Europe to, to get a digital single market and, and how that could improve performance? Uh, yes, I've uh, studied uh, the issue, first the overall issue of where Europe can get productivity and as was already mentioned, a uh, single digital market is one relatively obvious way of how you can get there rather than having this very segmented um, both regulatory system but also pricing system in general um, segmentation of this uh, market. How can it go forward? Well, uh, you know, uh, it's a relatively new market, so regulations fortunately are not decades or centuries old, so you should be able to change them relatively quickly. And this is within the purview, much of this regulation of the European uh, Commission. You would think that we'll be extremely excited to do this, and it has not happened. There is a lot of talk, even yesterday there was a big press release that now we, always see it, we are finally serious, we'll do it, and you read the press release, and actually they're not suggesting anything. <laughs> they're just excited. So um, there's a lack of leadership as well. Yeah, so in, the, in that market it is, to me, surprising. I know from my uh, policy experience in Europe when this issue was raised, immediately you get a couple of countries that we can all guess. Um, uh, uh, France is always the leader of that, that says, no, we don't want to be all together. We don't want to be a homogeneous market because we lose our identity, which is a strange kind of uh, comment to, um, uh, uh, to make, but somehow it has surprisingly to me carried the day in such uh, obvious market uh, integration uh, topics like, uh, uh, like digital market. And without that, we have actually, it was mentioned that in some sectors, Europe is quite good in adopting new technologies, that's true. We also have some sectors where we are very good in um, generating new technologies, like bio, um, biomedicine, for example. We are ahead of the US in, uh, in many things. But even where we do generate uh, technologies and we have good, uh, good uh, companies and businesses, mm -hmm. I'll finish with that, Basically, they cannot develop mm -hmm. quickly and they get sold out to Americans or, or Chinese and so on. And you look five years after they established, it's actually an American company. So that having 28 different national legislations are really uh, an obstacle. Yeah. Hurts. Uh, uh, just out of curiosity, I, I have the benefit of being a naive research economist solely, so I can ask this question because it strikes me that the way you view it and you explain to us the dilemma is that we realize uh, digital technologies come our way and, and, and then a political system can ignore that. I mean, it, it's not going to go away, right? Uh, automation, uh, digitization is going to happen anyway, with or without Europe. So, so what is the mechanism in, in, in your view that allows politicians to look the other way and hope it, it stops? Basically because a lot of the regulation first needs to be agreed on at the national level and if you, if you have two or three of the large players like uh, France, like Italy in this particular case, so no, no, this is not a topic now, let's wait, you're blocked. Mm -hmm. So the commission itself cannot go far enough uh, to unblock at least some of, uh, some of it uh, until a crisis comes and a crisis is going to come because we are lagging every year behind. Paul uh, Sandeman, the, the question on, on uh, welfare, the, the, the level of the welfare state is one of the questions actually here uh, also raised in several questions. Um, is the level of the welfare state an obstacle towards growth? Well, uh, my 
opinion largely is that well, the, the size of the welfare state is, is basically a kind of political question. And uh, if you want to have a large welfare state, that may mean you uh, end up having, uh, uh, of course, a smaller private sector, and uh, that may be more productive than the public sector. So overall growth may be, be lower on that. So that's kind of a trade-off. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, it's, it's, it's the politicians who will then decide if their trade-off seems uh, reasonable. And of course, uh, market forces affect that trade-off. Uh, so the trade-off today is much different from what it was many years ago, uh, because of the globalization, technology change, and so on. Uh, uh, and of course, then politicians should adapt uh, to the reality of, of the markets. And uh, for example, in, t in terms of taxation, of course, uh, there are lots of issues today. We know that that uh, it's easier to, to hide uh, money where taxes are not being, where taxes are not being, being that high. And, and of course, that will, will limit also the size of the public sector. Uh, and, and of course, that in just increases the, the cost of having a big uh, public sector. And, and of course, then uh, you would like the politicians to react to that. But, but can you find the right size? There's a question here. What should be the right level of government spending in order to have growth? Could you, could you say anything of that? So there are a number of academic studies that look at the interaction between public expenditure, pu public financing, and various measures, mostly economic measures, like economic growth, productivity, and the magic number among middle income and rich countries, which is uh, where Europe is, is basically between 40, 42, 43 percent. So a lot less than, uh, than Denmark, somewhat more than uh, Bulgaria, but uh, basically your government should be reducing expenditures um, Central European, East European government should be increasing them uh, uh, somewhat. Of course, one can say, well, it's not all about productivity and growth. We want to, you know, live in a society that where we think the government is better at providing um, services. I don't think so, but many people seem to think but so. Isn't it all about quali the quality of the spending, the efficient use of resources? Uh, welfare spending doesn't say anything. Would say Romania was very low on the schedule. Uh, the ranking you had, uh, if you lowered the average rate in, in Europe with 10%, will be on the Romanian level. And that is not, a, uh, you will not make certain that you will actually have efficient use of productive use of resources. Clemens, is, do you think there is some kind of, you know, uh, suggestions to politicians how they could change and transform the, the spending, the public spending, uh, to help enhance productivity in the economy? In economy? I, we, we have uh, debated this a lot, and, and uh, we have done a lot of research on productivity in various sectors, so very much like an input kind of driven uh, solution. And uh, when you look at these numbers and you study the societies of, of like Northern Europe, um, obviously there is a component that is on kind of, of, of the productivity of, of input. But there, to me, there's also a, a larger and larger share that should come from ambitious target setting and say, why don't we say um, that we are going to make it a goal for us here in Denmark to have an average length of life of 85 years, kind of five years plus. We will be able to achieve that in the next 15, 20 years. Mm. Um, that would give a hell of a lot of meaningful goals. It would give goals on education, it would give goals on technology, it would give goals on kind of some part of equality. Um, so in, instead of just saying, I'm going to make school teachers 10% more productive, or I'm going to adjust kind of things uh, in, in the system, then say, we will actually put out some ambitious goals for us and drive very specific kind of, of reforms from that. That is the kind of methodology that I'm getting more and more uh, uh, appealed by. Mm. Mm -hmm. You have a short comment? Yeah, I, I, I wonder if, if it is quite a, it's important maybe to distinguish between public expenditure and public provided services. So, so you ca can probably have quite a sizable state, but, but the state buying that service on the marketplace. Um, and and that, that is a very different economy, very different dynamic to productivity than the state trying to do everything mm. itself. Mm. Um, so, so like the state doesn't create their own computers because they need computers in their work, they buy those. Hopefully not. So, so, what, so the state can of course interact more with the marketplace uh, in most European countries. And I think Sweden is a wonderful example of experimenting uh, in, a, in, a, in a Scandinavian type model, experimenting with uh, buying services on a marketplace, and, and it, it, that has impact on the efficiencies Absolutely. you get. Uh. Absolutely. 
And also it's about the productive in investments. If, if the public sector is yeah. actually doing or state doing investments, yeah. it should be productive investments. So what, how can the state know about you know, productive investments? You know, and, and it, well, it's obvious, you have to invest in universities. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> service providers. Particularly this one. This one, yes. Oh, this yes. One. Start the top, here. The top question up here. I must present you for the top question here. What is your opinion on secular stagnation? Is it something that can be fixed? by structural reform and fiscal expansion, or are we doomed to lower growth? Bo, yeah. that must be a yeah. question for you. Okay, well and it's by Christian up here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, basically, if, if you look at the determinants of long-term growth, uh, that would be really productivity. And, and productivity is generally created by people getting good ideas that can be implemented to make uh, uh, production more efficient. Uh, so ideas are basically what generates long-term growth. And of course, if, if uh, the population in, in the industrial countries are, are getting smaller and smaller, then of course uh, there's a risk that we don't get more and more of these ideas that will lead to higher productivity. Uh, if you look at the, kind of the, part, the, the um, post World War II period, of course we had huge expansion of populations in, in, in Europe and in the US. That created growth as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so there is a problem with stagnating populations. Mm because that could be what was, was generating uh, the growth for, for the long haul. Uh, so, so there is certainly an issue there. Of course, you could argue that you could have a large share of the population going into uh, to, to, to research and development. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the very long run, of course, there is an upper limit, uh, yeah. but still for, for a very long time, we, we could probably still do that. But what are the most effective structural reforms that, that actually should be done right now in Europe? Could you just give me some examples, Simeon? I was actually going to say that uh, the idea of a country, a small market, or even a large market in Europe having its own idea of how to run uh, the state and having a welfare state more than other countries, actually cannot exist within a truly open market. Because what happens then? Well, then people from Romania and Bulgaria say, well, other than the weather, you know, I really like Denmark, so I'm going there because, you know, they're going to provide me with more opportunities. And then uh, people who come from outside of Europe, as we have, I saw one of the questions here on uh, migration and refugees, also come to Europe and then say, well, where should I go? Should I go to Bulgaria? Not very well paid. But nice weather, should I go to Denmark? Yeah, Not the question so nice is, weather, I us, uh, Sadowskas has uh, actually questioned, is refugee crisis a solution to low population and economical growth in Europe? That's the question. I'm is it? In my view, it is. Uh, although this is a very dis hotly disputed uh, view, so if I was a politician at the moment, I would probably not say but it. But I'm uh, listening to politicians <laughs> and saying it's, it's trouble. It's trouble coming and it's uh, high cost for the state, you know, welfare benefits, etc. We et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the previous discussion made this point that if you look at long term productivity growth, it's basically more and newer people coming into high productive uh, industries. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't have many people in Europe now. You can have some movement from Eastern Europe to Western and Northern Europe, and that's happening. But if you suddenly have an infusion of a couple of million um, people a year from outside of the Union to Europe, suddenly that can create the type of, uh, of uh, labor mobility that uh, Europe uh, lacks. It's not going to be immediate, however, because just the number of people is not enough. They have to be trained, they need to know the languages, they need to operate uh, within an environment that is productive, and that takes some years. Boom. Of yeah. course, sorry. Be an economist. I, I, I could agree on that, but of course, we also have to consider the political issues here. And then just taking Denmark here, well, it would be easy to find a majority against uh, further immigration in, in, in Denmark for, for probably for other reasons, because probably you think they are too difficult to integrate in, in, the, in the Danish uh, labor market and Danish economy. Uh, so there is a potential, of course, but it's not easy to actually to, to reap that potential. Uh, and I'm, I'm quite sure in many European countries today there's a kind of an animosity uh, against uh, the, the immigration flows that, that we're seeing at the moment. So, so it is a tricky question and, and uh, uh, there is a potential, but I'm not but that without optimistic. Without labor market reforms, you can't really. It's difficult to integrate. We have yeah. a closed society in some yeah, way, in cultural yeah. terms as well. You recognize in Danish debate, if you talk about uh, labor market reforms, you will even see some politicians backing off. Well, now we're hurting our domestic, our ethnic Danes, uh, to integrate these, these refugees. And, well, 
uh, certainly someone would be, would be against it. So, so there are politi polit pol political issues there that are important. Philip, I think to, to, to add to that, basically to, and, and to full circle to your question, sort of what are the most effective structural reforms? I think what economists often ignore is the timing of when these reforms actually work or when, when they, their impact comes. So if you take, for example, Simeon's proposal about the digital market integration, that impact will be extremely swift. Uh, US-European free trade agreement that has an extremely quick impact on, on creating productivity and growth. Now, investing in human capital, it's going to take 25 years before you see the impact. So, and, and, and that's in a, in a textbookish world, you don't worry that much about it, but I think in a polit political world that matters. And, and here migrants, are, 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 it, in some sense, can be a quick fix, given that it is the right human capital composition. And, and that, I think, is, is an open question. I, I, I have no idea if the migrant flows we can attract in Europe have the right human capital ca characteristics or not. There are also studies, economic studies uh, done on this, and actually the, the phenomena is when they're coming in the, the, uh, the bottom of the market, yeah. actually the, the local salaries also are rising yeah. for yeah. You know, exactly. domestic. Okay. So I think what we need to uh, think about is that our world is going to change quite significantly the next 15 years. So from a technological point of view, it's going to change much more the next 15 years than it did the last 15 years. Mm. And in the last 15 years, we had the internet, we had mobile phones, we found the genome, or kind of coded it, decoded it. So the, the change we will see is going to be quite... Robotics, uh, automation, It's going to be quite sensors. staggering yeah. across all sectors, which means that we will have a relatively fast impact on the labor composition that, that we need. Uh, so if you look at the sectors that we have in, if you just take it a Danish perspective, right? And we have like the least productive sectors. We prefer European perspective here. Yeah, but, but you can also take the European perspective okay. and say kind of take agriculture, mm. right? Kind of low yeah. productivity, mm. massive kind of, but kind of reduced labor force. We have kind of the, the big middle service sectors. And then we have the high uh, value adds kind of pharma, machining, uh, kind of, of things like that. And, and, and that composition, you, we know that we will have a, a, an enormous labor escape from transportation in 15 years' time. I mean, it, it's not really a question. We know that's going to happen. And we also know that the retail landscape is going to change quite significantly. So if we can kind of think those pictures out a little bit and then benchmark our productivity against that picture, mm -hmm. I think it's going to give us a lot of the answer. I think McKinsey have done uh, many interesting studies on the resource uh, revolution, the resource economy, whatever, and, and actually we've talked a lot about, you know, labor productivity, but also resource efficiency is coming in, and also as part of the, the question of the digital single uh, market could also be effective in that sense uh, in, in, in able to enhance uh, an energy union uh, being effective that people have knowledge about the consumption they're actually uh, in, at their home or at their labor uh, place or workplace, or it could be the transportation, whatever. So information, digitalization, and resource efficiency is coming together in some way. Yes. But, but how can Europe do something that really matters in that field? Well, I, I think that comes back to uh, what we said before, target setting. So I think actually energy and the renewable energy revolution is actually a good example of something that could become quite successful. So we completely change the energy composition of Europe before other markets, and we are thus changing the energy markets and kind of resource kind of efficiency of, of the world. So, so setting targets for the energy sector, setting targets for kind of the digital trade uh, in Europe, and, and setting targets for health, if we, if we are able to do that and agree on that kind of targets, and also have targets that the voters actually would like to have, right? L let's not kid ourselves and kind of put austerity targets that the voters don't want to have. Let's put out some attractive targets for everybody, and and derive things from there. So I'm we not take painful targets in Europe. Actually. No, but you need to have meaningful targets. Okay. Hmm. That's an interesting point. I like the targets uh, idea. They have to be, I think, very narrow. For example, the 85 years uh, life expectancy, and then you work around it, because otherwise, if we just say we want to be... Remember, we had the Lisbon Agenda 2000. By 2010, Europe will be more competitive than the US. Exactly the opposite happened. So we went down, the US went up. So, and then European politicians said, sorry, we missed it. 
Um, so we need to have very narrow targets, and then I agree with you, then uh, we actually have a, a chance. I think what we haven't, and perhaps this is outside of our realm, but I should just mention it, is that when we discuss Europe, you get to the point of who is Europe, so who are the decision hmm. makers in Europe, and you get to the point that actually, while at the national level we have governments and ultimately the prime minister or the head of state decides on things, in Europe it's not even clear who decides. The European institutions are still, let's put it politely, so um, uh, still developing and evolving that if you ask the question who decides, let's say, on um, on uh, single capital markets, on uh, single energy policy. It's not obvious. We have, you know, that's why we have the five presidents report. You know, there was this recent mm. report, uh, European report on mm. uh, the future of the union. Five presidents, uh, European institutions, presidents wrote it. So that gives you an idea. Nobody's deciding. But did no, they did not make a, a difference, really. No, finally. five people sort of met signed something, I'm sure somebody else wrote it, and then there is no decision maker. During the Eurozone crisis, you remember this famous phrase by Tim Geithner, the finance minister of um, US, who asked, you know, when I had to ask a question or decide something on Greece, I don't know who to call. You have a quote in your new book <laughs> coming out, you know, uh, Europe is afraid of strategic thinking. Too many tactical and incremental proposals are coming out, also from think tanks as well. <laughs> uh, so we have to think big, like you also proposed, uh, Clemens. What can, we, what can we actually do uh, in order to, uh, to, uh, to, to get out of this leadership crisis? I think a wonderful example of recent years is uh, how, how Germany changed its entire energy policy. Mm. And, and what it took was not meetings, it was not a discourse, it was not a think tank, it was an earthquake in Japan. Mm. And suddenly that entire nation could do a 140 so degrees turnaround. So wonderful crisis then, okay. So, and I, I think in a sense, uh, you said in your talk, sort of you basically the bad decision making that might be going on is what it needs, it needs a deeper crisis. And uh, it's a shame that one sort of open-eyed, wide-eyed, is, is heading into a, a worse spot before it becomes better. But it appears to me that we have crisis all the time, so why don't we react, we react, we react uh, very slowly towards uh, new, finding new solutions? Well, you saw it in the charts, we have so much leisure, we have a good time in Europe anyway, oh. and oh we yeah. don't work, well, so, that's good. so why worry? South in Europe probably needs a women crisis. Oh, yeah. If you look at the labor participation, yeah. I mean, you start late, you go kind of, late, kind of early on pension, yeah. and half of the labor force has a much, much lower participation. So if you get a, a fantastic women crisis in South of Europe, we could maybe get the participation up. One of the key ingredients yeah. is going to be participation of women in that. But it would not market. be migration of women from Southern Europe. I'm open to all kinds of solutions. All kinds of solutions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm married to Spain, so in fact, <laughs> important university. Uh, but there is a question up here. Uh, more growth will, might come with the cost. Is more inequality the price we have to pay? What do you think about that question? Well, there is no uh, simple relationship between growth and, and inequality. It can actually go both ways, I would, mm. I would say. So, so uh, of course, you can make reforms that will lead to more growth, and at the same time, uh, it will hurt uh, equality. But you can also do the opposite. So it really depends on the type of, of reform you're, you're making. Uh, so so uh, before we know specifically which type of reforms are, are actually uh, be, going to be, be pushed through, we, we, we don't know if it, we need, need to, we'll get more inequality. But of course, the, as the markets are, uh, I think there is a kind of a, there's a secular movement towards more in inequality, uh, driven by globalization, by... But does, that, does that need to be a problem with higher growth that, that could actually, you know, everybody could benefit? Yeah, sure, sure. So, so it's, it, it's more that if you, some view that, that uh, uh, there is a problem of, of, of inequality and that sometimes it can lead to, to kind of uh, uh, social unrest and so on, but, but I guess there's no really uh, strong evidence on that. But, yeah. but, uh, uh, to some extent, you can see as, as long as you get everyone kind of benefit from it, uh, there's, there's probably no, no problem. But we, we also seen that like in, in the U.S., where the kind of the, 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 the bottom of the income distribution has more or less had no increase in, in their real wage for since the you know, the early 90s or so. Um, well, of course, the top incomes have have, have uh, kind of been running away. Uh, so, so it, it depends on how much this can kind of trickle down will actually uh, occur. And of course, if there is some trickle down, I, th I think there's uh, 
probably uh, no problem in, in that. But looking at the historical perspective, you, we, we've seen you know, Central European and Eastern European countries coming into the single market, you know, being part of this, having a high, you know, uh, actually, actually uh, we, we saw a, a high growth scenario uh, in those countries being included in the market. So actually, looking at the historical perspective, we've seen less inequality in Europe, but maybe there are more inequality inside nation states. The different perspectives, I think it's important. So since I spent about half of my time in the US uh, and follow this inequality debate, not only as an economist, but also as participate participator in the public debate there, it's interesting and all in also how it's very different from Europe. So inequality in the United States, just statistically, in the United States and the United Kingdom is in fact increasing over the last 15 years. That's not the case in continental Europe, so just statistically. There is an increase in inequality, but it's very focused on the US, on the UK, um, Australia, actually Anglo-Saxon countries uh, interestingly have this, uh, this trend. In the US lately, this has become the main topic, both presidentially and otherwise. And what uh, one finds, which has relevance for Europe as well, is that it used to be that if you get better education, you essentially are uh, not in danger of falling into sort of an inequality trap. You're going up. No longer. In the last 10 years, even well-educated people in the US with university education tend to actually, in particular regions of the country, tend to become relatively poor. And this is a question, why don't they move? Because the US is one market. They should just move to better areas. They do not. Going to Europe, this is why I don't like at all this idea of let's now segment again Europe either because of refugees or because of others. This is what's going to happen in Europe. The little mobility that we have now, if we segment uh, again in some ways, we're going to have pockets of uh, poverty, even in countries like Denmark, even in countries like Germany. We see this happening in the US. There's an interesting question here, it's also connected to this uh, conversation here about uh, inequality and, and but also about how to benchmark oneself and what kind of perspective do we need to have. And it's Jens uh, questioning, why benchmark us with US? The middle class in US has not experienced a better purchasing power the last decades. Do we want the Trump effect, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but, but what do we measure? Uh, and I think it's, it's a crucial thing. You know, what about the middle classes? The, this, you know, enchanted middle classes in Europe, you know, are frustrated. And we also see some, some amount of frustration in the United States. What can we do about that, that challenge? Clemens. That's a big question. I, I, I was looking at this uh, TV program earlier this week, showing two neighborhoods in, uh, in Olbo with the difference of life expectancy of 16 years kind of within the same city. So kind of this, there's like this pocket of, of inequality and poverty in our societies mm -hmm. that is quite staggering. Um, and uh, I think kind of we will have to uh, agree as a as society where we want to go. Kind of is that the road that we want to go down and kind of in 10 years that's, that difference is going to be 25 years? Uh, because that will have other consequences for, for society. Um, so, I actually don't have any kind of really good solutions for but that. The big, the big question is actually, we had this idea of progress that actually our kids would come out better than ourselves, you know, and, and this is, there is some certain amount of, you know, uh, crisis here because of, you know, many people feel that their, their kids are not coming out better than they, and their lives, you know, getting more complicated, et cetera, et cetera. But, but they, they probably feel that way because it might be that way. Hmm. Uh, I and think I so. think it is, yeah, absolutely. I think kind of this is a, a matter of uh, transparency, education, uh, and granular measures to, uh, to try to uh, stem against this. But they, just, yeah. sorry, just to yeah. add to that, it's not that they thought that their kids, it's not only that they thought their kids would be better off than there, they also knew the way that their kids would be better off than there, which was through education. And now what's happening is, not to alarm the students among you, that even with better education, you're actually not guaranteed to be better than your parents. And that's very, very by now prevalent in the uh, US. And it seems in statistics to be actually starting to seep in uh, in Europe as well. So education doesn't buy you anymore the ticket to uh, prosperous life. 
Yeah. But, but, I, mean, I wouldn't believe I would say this, but, but there are serious economists that start to wonder if we are measuring progress correctly, right? Uh, you know, all of you know this debate about growth correctly yeah, is one of the questions qu up here. Quality, how, how should we adjust for quality? Uh, the sort of health service I can get today is much better than 10, 20 years ago. Even so, income-wise, I might still be stuck in the lowest end. I think the big issue between um, 10 years ago, what we have argued in the US, what is the, the, the difference in the US is that those that are high productive individuals can afford to buy the services from the low productive individuals. Well, in Europe, we have installed our society so that we cannot afford uh, to buy the services of the lower productivity individuals and, and, and force them so to be out of employment or whatever it is. And I think that, that's where the structural difference uh, that, that, that could be tackled in Europe eventually. Bo, do you want to have a comment on this? No. No. I think I'll open up for some questions from the floor, actually, because there's one conversation going on here and someone is calling the phone. Uh, so, uh, please, raise your hands. We have some mics going around here, I think. Yeah? Please. Somebody want to raise a question? Or we'll just continue. Oh, there's a question down there. Okay, good. Down there. Run. <laughs> raise your hands. Good, and please yeah, tell hello. us, what's uh, your name? You have yet to discuss climate policy uh, within the European Union, which is a topic which most of European countries agree upon. Is this a potential area where, we, when we all agree, we can all work towards a larger goal, as uh, the guy, the, sorry, the man from McKinsey argued? I forgot your name, sorry. Clemens. Clemens. Oh, Clemens, yes, but should we discuss climate policy as the target sort of this Bottom line, I mean, suddenly the Danish government is cutting subsidies towards uh, what's it called, energy policy and the uh, how minimal paga, sorry. Um, yeah. Is this something where we should say climate policy, we all agree, let's work towards this goal and then we say uh, mold the economy to fit this goal that we, we need to reach certain target or threshold? Mm -hmm. Okay, please. I think that's a, I mean, that is my opinion. I think that's a great idea. I, I think that is, that is a goal that where we have a majority of society that actually is worried about. We have scientists, and a large majority of scientists that actually su support uh, the theory of kind of, of human caused uh, kind of, of global warming. Uh, we have technology uh, that can help us get these goals. We have uh, a, a geography that uh, means that we are a little bit low on, on oil. Uh, so there, there are many, many aspects here that says this would be a, a really good, meaningful uh, goal for, uh, for Europe that would help us to actually create uh, economic and uh, kind of labor uh, transformation. So I kind of completely agree with that. But if I yeah, please. If I may add, it gets again to the point of how decision-making is made at the European Union level. So we gave the example of uh, uh, nuclear power in, uh, in Germany, a great example, but one government, so Angela Merkel basically decides, uh, does it, it seems to now gain more popularity among uh, Germans. In Europe, we work on nearly every issue by consensus. So it's enough for one country to say we're against it, and there are at least two countries that I know that are against it. Poland, because of coal, and the Czech Republic, because they generally like to be against whatever the rest uh, suggests. <laughs> okay, good. So we need a different decision-making process as well. Other questions out there? there or oh, you are not timid here. Okay, good. Please make it short. As I heard it, um, increased economic integration within the Europe could be a solution to some of these challenges we face. But at the same time, we see Austria um, Le Pen in France, Cobra in the uh, UK, and generally in all European countries we have the far right or the far left who are against globalization. How should we challenge these perspectives? Okay. Someone might add something to that? I, I, I share that frustration. I oh, think it has, has, has never been as easy to create an anti-EU argument. Uh, and it's surprising, and in particular in countries that have, had be, have been the big winners of European integration. In a country like Denmark, uh, I think it's the 22nd richest country in the world this day today. 
uh, without any significant natural resources, no huge industrial base, there's, there's nothing special about the country, number 22 in the world ranking, right? Oh, it's a German speaking, yeah. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the great universities, exactly. So, so, no, so, but, but, and, and so obviously one that what is driving that is the ability to integrate this economy with the global marketplace, and that is predominantly the European marketplace. And, and it's surprising me. I think it's a, maybe it's our fault as economists that we are not good enough at explaining why integration is useful for the economy. So more research then, okay. Uh, well, okay. yeah. <laughs> Paul, could you explain? It might, uh, might be right. It, it could be. Well, I, I guess you could also argue that, that uh, the way the EU handles its policy administration could be sharpened somewhat. Mm -hmm. And I guess if, if, if we could cut somewhat down on the red tape in, in the EU, that could uh, perhaps create a better environment for, for, for making EU also a more active player in, in this. If, if, I, if I may on this yeah, one, so, yeah, yeah, okay. so it's a red tape story. So, so it, it's, you make it sound as if in Denmark there's no rules whatsoever. Uh, so I, mean, Denmark is pro I mean, in Denmark, the, as the, state, the, okay. state, the state saves my money so I have money to go on a holiday. I mean, mm. how much rule is that? <laughs> uh, you like so that? <laughs> no, I, I say, so, so it's, uh, we have this... Uh, these, um, and the red tape story is also something about the single market, you know, they actually cut a lot of red mm. tape around Europe. Yeah, but so the story goes, all the European countries would be total anarchistic market, free market economies, and it's only because of Brussels regulation, I think the contrary is true. Every oh. single European country has a bad track record of doing silly regulations, and at Brussels at least tries to harmonize it somehow. What do you think, Paul? Yeah, well, there's still a, a lot of animosity in, in the various countries that uh, they think there is a lot of waste going on, and... and uh, so, so if, if we're going to have a more uh, greater, greater desire for Europe to, European Commission to play a role there, I think uh, uh, each individual country, the, the citizens there, should be able to, to see that what is done there is actually meaningful and not just seen as a, as a waste of resources. Okay, once more, Eva? Um, I think it is worrying that uh, you mentioned some countries for me it's worrying that even some of the biggest bene uh, beneficiaries of, uh, of eu money like poland like hungary like slovakia have turned uh, smaller countries perhaps in the bigger picture but you know they have turned very nationalistic um, austria as well actually in studies of across the eu who has gained so far the most from integration it's actually austria because all of central and eastern europe opened at some point looked where to invest and how to do it, and Austria was right there, sitting pretty. So it benefited a lot, and to see Austria now turning against the European um, uh, Union is quite striking, but not that populism, because it's populism, it's not just nationalism, it's pure populism, comes because of two reasons, this rise of inequality or in general feeling that something is not quite working in Europe, together with a fairly stale political system in a number of our uh, countries. So Austria has been... But finally they got a green, you know, unknown president. No, that, that's what I'm saying. So, but there were two parties there, highly corrupt uh, by world standards, not just by Austrian standards, and somebody actually managed to win over them. We should be happy about that, uh, because uh, corruption in uh, politics in, uh, in Europe is, maybe not in Denmark, in the rest of Europe, is actually quite high, and some change is useful. I have a last question here from the floor, okay? Somebody? Yeah, please, just speak up. Okay, so I, I'm still wondering... You, you have to shout loud, you know, because... So we'll repeat it. I just asked him, you know, so I was, I was wondering about this... You know, uh, I think we'll just wait to the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can hear you back, yeah. Please. No, I just wondered how I could uh, get a job at one of these top universities, so... I know it's going to be difficult, but so you have this statistics with the U.S. being predominantly uh, in the picture, and then the question is, how, what can Europe do? Do you have a suggestion for what Europe could do to make get its own ranking? I suppose. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Uh, perhaps an even more productive solution. So I've worked in, as I said, I've worked for a bit, a bit at Harvard, I now work at LSE, so I've seen some of these uh, universities. What is the difference between them and most of continental? Uh, uh, Europe, uh, I would say, there is a huge, relative to most continental European universities, there is a huge focus on research, very well paid, uh, so it's not, universities are thought mostly to be research places, 
and then you teach and then the students learn not just in class but they learn basically by being part of this research environment. Most of continental Europe is you teach and then if you on the side do some research that's great but it's not really the main uh, thing. So focus a lot on research and internationalization. This is always mm. a big part of just bringing new, um, new ideas and Europe generally is lagging very significantly behind that. Mm. It's also competition, you know. Well, it brings, yeah, that's yeah. right, new ideas, competition. Exactly. You're right. One question here, the last um, one. <coughs> I noticed that not one single member of the panel has mentioned uh, monetary policy or European Central Good. Bank. Good, then we'll have a question. Uh, <laughs> does that mean that you consider monetary policy or the Syrian interest rate policy or quantitative easing for absolutely useless in the context of economic growth? Okay, Simeon, you'll have the first one here. I have a contrarian view. Yes, I think it's absolutely useless and in Europe it was done late uh, and it was done badly and now that it's uh, done badly and late as most European policies, we're doing it a lot more than we should um, before we turn the corner. So generally it's not the right answer to Europe's problems. And what about the Americans? They did it fast? I think they did it fast, it was the same wrong policy, but they did it much faster and they finished quickly and declared victory and then markets somehow were convinced, you know, these guys may know something that we don't know, so it must be right. Well, we waited and waited and it was obviously wrong. Philip. Well, well maybe a bit egoistic because I don't want to ch change my entire reading list for the autumn macro class. <laughs> Uh, so, so, I, 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 so there's still a room for traditional macroeconomic policies like monetary policy or fiscal policy, but, but we have to understand what, what, what Simeon pinpoints is, a, is the trend growth. So, uh, and, and, and that's very different from trying to navigate the economy through the business cycle. And I think the traditional macro policy tools uh, have their justification also in 2016 uh, in navigating the economy through the business cycle to some extent. They might not be as effective as they used to be, but they still have some effect. But, but they don't solve long-term growth problems. Paul, well, you want to come in? The, EC, the ECB was kind of preoccupied with saving Greece uh, and so on, so, so they probably had their minds elsewhere. Uh, and also I agree certainly that, they, that they, regarding the, 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 the kind of the more macro policy uh, in, in, in the EU, they were a bit late, for sure. We have one top question here, and I must ask this question because it's really the one most voted. Uh, 42 actually voted this one. Henrik has asked, there have been 200 civilizations through history, all collapsed. Is the European growth challenge a sign of history naturally repeating itself? Clemens. Oh, big question. It's a big one, but McKinsey is for big questions, <laughs> aren't they? But uh, kind of the, um, the answer is obviously yes. It's just a question of time. Okay. In the end, we <laughs> all die. <laughs> what do you think, Simeon? I'm actually more optimistic for a change on this. I oh. think, uh, fortunately, uh, Europe is um, multicultural. You can enter Europe through many ways, no matter how many walls we try to build various countries. And it's still very attractive for basically the rest of uh, the world. So we will be uh, uh, renewing ourselves, so to speak, simply because there are many other people in the world who still want to come um, to us. And as long as we have more people and we provide some reasonable policies to let them uh, in and uh, integrate them, I think that uh, we will not only grow, but basically experience uh, good lives. Philip, you formerly worked with McKinsey, I can't really, sorry, but now you're an independent researcher. Do you subscribe to the doom and gloom uh, um, argument of Clemens? Well, sorry, Clemens. yes, I actually agree with both, because oh, I good. note that out of these 200-something civilizations, a lot of them were European. Yes. So, so, so yeah. this, we might be facing a collapse, but I'm sure that if you just wait long enough, Europe will be on top again. Hmm. Both? I'm pretty sure it won't happen when any of us here will be, be alive, but uh, well, there's always a, always a risk uh, for that. And uh, if you look at the, the, the way the world has developed, it's only the like past 200 years we have any growth in, in, in the world, and um, well, it may not last forever. But what about the Brexit? That's also a question, and as Haturas Sadauskas, once more, Eastern European name, uh, it's wonderful. Will Brexit start a contagion in Europe? That could be detonating this trend towards the final end. Clemens. First of all, yeah, I, I, don't, I, I, think, uh, I think Brexit uh, hopefully is not going to happen. Okay, I, yes. I actually think so. so. Uh, and um, but if some of the happens. brokers kind of, of uh, agree with me. 
Um, no, but there is something around, if you think about the big dynasties of, of the world that have lasted kind of centuries, um, the, the current European construction of governance, leadership, and so on, is not a construction that's going to carry many, many centuries. Mm -hmm. That does not mean that we won't be able to improve it and, mm -hmm. and change it and, and mm -hmm. so on. That's obviously going to take, yeah. take time. Uh, but obviously, if, if Brexit is going to happen, I think I think kind of what we can hope for is that that would be uh, the crisis that we need to do some reform. So we get enlightenment. So, so, so after I, the I'm I'm hopeful that if that would happen, we could actually use it for something good. Some kind of new European Renaissance after the, the <laughs> terrible <laughs> Middle Ages. Renaissance, but at least kind of that is a, a proper cause for self-reflection. Mm. Philip. I think Brexit, if it happens or not, or is about the debate, may, might have the one advantage that it helps Europe to focus on areas where it, it very quickly and visibly can show that it matters and that it actually benefits Europeans. And, and, and I think a lot of that are in, the, in economic er areas, sort of the economic integration, digital integration. And so in a sense, the idea of disintegrating Europe and the might help it focus, because the history of Europe is it started, I think, with the coal and steel community, right? Mm. So, so it started with very simple economic and ideas. Now it must be the digital union. Yeah, so yeah. basically simple ideas that everyone understands this is good for us, let's mm. do it. And, and that might be a benefit of, of uh, having the Brexit debate. Paul? Well, I basically think that, that the UK never been kind of wholeheartedly member of, of the EU, so, so I'm not seeing that as that risk. Uh, uh, You'd rather kick them out then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, I think they, they have been, been really trying to, to, to well, get as good a deal as, as possible for a very long time. And, and uh, well, maybe it's, it's not that difficult uh, to, to uh, get on without them. What, what uh, would be the suggestions if you should go and really have three you know, answers to the European growth challenge? What would be the priorities? What, what would be the, uh, you know, the, the main priorities for you in order to solve this? S the crisis of, of growth and the, the, the trend towards stagnation and an older, aging Europe, you know, even becoming Japanized. You know. Simeon. I would say digital Three. market, single digital market the first. first. It's easy. I, you can do it literally in a couple of years. Um, single capital markets, we haven't discussed much, but a lot can be done mm. to just finance new, new companies, new um, uh, innovation. And number three, I would say it takes a long time, but uh, changing our educational system, particularly university educational system, to be more flexible. So less lecturing, more integrated process of let's figure out how things are. Mm. I think um, uh, I think technology is going to be a key. I think kind of that is going to be such a large change factor in the in the next years. So it's not all, ab all only about digitalization. It is digitalization. It is genetics. It is kind of biomedicine. It is kind of automation and production. It is it is a technological broad revolution. Mm -hmm. So I think kind of if we can uh, embrace that mm -hmm. uh, kind of that, then that is going to be a something that is going to uh, shape most of the uh, sectors that we actually need to, to re kind of reform. So I think that's going to be a, a very, very large uh, enabler. And then uh, secondly, I think we should uh, remember kind of, of why Europe is actually such a great place to, to live in and, and cherish those values, which is uh, uh, kind of unbelievably strong. I think we should be really <laughs> lucky that we're living in this part of the world and have a positive outlook on, uh, on growing old in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. So good, positive you know, minds. Bo, I'll just jump. Well, well I guess uh, uh, reforms will be important. And, uh, as what kind as of reforms? Yeah, well, uh, just as, as Simon's presentation showed, there's a great variety of problems in, within Europe. And therefore, uh, certainly one size fits all I hope won't, won't do. But each country will have to consider uh, reforms, of course, the countries where they have very la low number of, of uh, people in the labor force. They should consider, well, what is the problem here? How can we address that? Uh, that may be cutting taxes in, in, in other places, maybe may, may done differently. But certainly reforms that are kind of tailored to the specific problems that are uh, most pressing in, in, in the different countries. And, and uh, that was kind of the... Uh, 
most important. I think there are lots of obstacles to, to, to growth in, in Europe and uh, lots of rigidities that uh, could be removed. Um, so I'll, I'll certainly pinpoint that as... as, as, as uh, what is the biggest rigidity? Pardon? What, what is the biggest rigidity? Uh, well, it's in anything from, from uh, like pension ages to labor market regulations that, that, that uh, will, will can, be, can, be, can be liberalized uh, and, and, and make it really a, a truly also a, a European labor market. Um, mm. Philip, that. you'll have the last shot. Well, I would uh, think the most complicated is, is probably the human capital investment that Simi also managed, uh, mentioned, and, and that is, I think that's where there is the most to harvest. But, but more shorter term goals, I think, would be, I would take the point we had in our, our panel right now is sort of uh, the public sector development. So getting the public sector more efficient, uh, higher productivity, that frees resources in the economy. Uh, and there's, uh, I'm thinking healthcare, uh, elder, care of the elderly, and so there are actually a lot of efficiency to, to get there, and that will be very important for creating growth in Europe. And the last thing, the simplest thing of, of all worlds is uh, TTIP. It, it basically comes for free. Uh, you have to struggle down some special interests, but it will boost um, our innovation ability, our, our uh, productivity um, ability, and it will probably also uh, trigger automatically the digital uh, development in Europe. Okay, thank you very much to Bo Sandeman Rasmussen, Philip Schröder, Clemens Jata, and Simeon Djankov for this uh, wonderful conversation. And thanks to all of you for listening, uh, for listening here. And uh, I don't know, I want to give the word once more to Pierre. Please come up here. So uh, I just want to repeat the thanks on behalf of the university to Bo, Philip, uh, Clemens, sorry, Simeon, uh, for thought-provoking. Um, well, I have to say you didn't quite get to answering all the questions that I sort of thought I cleverly put. I thought the one on, I, I think Philip actually got off the hook a little bit too easy on the, where you sort of say, well, yes, Europe is down the drain. Yeah, well, they're probably down the drain, but eventually. So, you know, remember I had this question about the Roman Empire collapsing. Yes, we came back, but it took an awful long time so uh, but anyway so we'll have to go and wait and think a little bit more about this uh, along with you guys and uh, I hope that all of you younger guys got a lot of inspiration to work on so, so now you can start pestering econ professors and other on uh, on ideas for MSc dissertations etc PhD projects sort of following from this so I urge you to do that and remember that I, I am the head of the graduate school so I get to get a look at this and prioritize things. So I would like to see much more on that. Uh, because one of the things I see, and that's sort of a personal side remark, of course, econ as a science seen from the head of a graduate school is becoming very, very fragmented. I realize, and I know the Bo's involved and Philip is involved and others, that of course you have to learn the tools of the trade before you can master and address the bigger quest uh, questions. However, of course, there is also the risk that you spend 10 years getting into the nitty gritty of too much detailed methodologies. So sometimes I get the idea that there may be too few sort of projects opened up uh, to sort of address bigger questions. Uh, so that's just a thought. Anyway, that's not your fault. Uh, so thank you again. I, I think you, we should give these guys a warm round of uh, applause yet again. And then I'll give the word to Fakhe for some final remarks, Boris. So big round of applause for these guys. Can I have the mic? Thank you. So first of all, thank you everyone for joining us. It has been a really, really interesting experience. And we have already counted who have been the two most voted questions. And we have two winners. The first winner is Henrik, who asked the question about the doomed civilization and if Europe is going to follow. Henrik, would you please mind joining us here on stage? And the second winner <laughs> and the second winner is Marcel for asking the question, 
whether growth may actually come at a cost. So this is the second most voted question. A round of applause to Marcel and to Henrik, congratulations. So we have these two books, so The Great Rebirth, Lessons from the Victory of Capitalism over Communism. Congratulations, Henrik, that's for you on behalf of Professor Simon Jankov and as well Faka. So you also have the opportunity to have it personally signed by him. Marcel, you have the honor to get one of the latest books of uh, Mr. Simon Jankov, which is Inside the Euro Crisis Eyewitness Account. Congratulations. Let's give them one round of applause for asking the provocative questions. Finally, this concluded our last part of the event, which was the public debate. However, we also need to mention a few very, very important organizations without which this event would have never been uh, what it was. First of all, we would like to thank our sponsors. This has been Aarhus BSS, the Department of Economics and Business Economics for the generous financial support, as well Aarhus BSS for the organizational support, Ina Hessel and Mercedes-Benz, who have been the official transportation partner of this event, ensuring that our panelists travel in the utmost comfort. As well, the Tuborg Foundation, who has been so generous as well to sponsor a big part of the financial burden of this event. On behalf of FACA, once again, I would like to thank you for your active participation, for asking not only the obvious questions, but also the hard questions, as we saw. With these words, I'll wrap it off, and I would invite you please to join us for a mingling session, networking, and as well, a little bit of food. Thank you very much for being an active part of all those.